after the January forum, I don't usually make political statements, but je suis Charlie. Whoa. Wow. Hey. Uh, so this morning we have a we we have, we have the I, I want to say famous, but it's probably true. <laughs> infamous is a much better infamous, word I would prefer. Infamous, yeah. Jack Salt. I want to be infamous. You want to be infamous? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. So, and the topic this morning is choosing an entity when you start when you start a business. So it's very important to know: should you be a C corp? Should you be an S corp? Should you be an LLC? What's the right entity for you? Because it has great bearing on. On your profitability and on your tax, uh, on, on your tax structure, and uh, 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 you know your um, vulnerabilities. So um, we now have Jack to tell us all about it. Jack, thanks, Dave. Thank you. I got to tell you, I'm shocked when so many people want to come and hear this subject. This is about as boring as it gets, but <laughs> I usually do tax, which is the thing I really like talking about. But this, I'm going to do this from a Protective standpoint, and because I'm a tax man, I look at it from a tax perspective, um, which a lot of people don't necessarily do. Um, I started my career at PricewaterhouseCoopers, Coopers and Librand, I should say, and I was lucky enough to do tax reorganizations, and that's where I kind of got into this. I used to reorganize companies. I did the reorganization for Dow Jones and a whole bunch of other companies. The Lefrak family, which has more real estate in New York City than other family, I did their tax reorganization when I was in another firm. And I just find this area of the law very fascinating. And I look at it from the merger between the tax and the corporate law perspective. And I started practicing a lot of corporate law when I was at a phone company when I was their general counsel. Um, so as Dave said, these are kind of the important reasons. You know, Why does it matter? Asset protection is really the number one most important reason. If you form the wrong type of entity, um, then your assets are vulnerable. Everyone hears these commercials all the time. Form an LLC and everything's protected, right? This is what you'll hear. Everyone always says that. Um, and by show of hands, and I never usually do this, but how many people who are business owners here have an LLC? All right. And how many have an S corporation? Okay. All right. Wow. Interesting. More than I expected. Okay. <laughs> no, you just don't mean see, seeing so many people with S corporation. I'm an S corporation fan, so that's why I say that. Tax considerations, at the end of the day, it's money. Really, that's the other thing I think that's the most important asset protection. And then how much are you going to pay in taxes? Because at the end of the day, that's really what does matter as business owners. Um, ownership considerations, how you can own it, people coming in and out. <clears throat> Growth considerations, what do you do when the business grows? And if, God bless you, if you're able to do this, you eventually want to go public. And then conversion considerations, what if you're in the wrong entity and then you want to change it to another? We're not going to get much into this because this, this is about a week and I, I, you'll fall asleep. So, but this is e as one of the most important things to worry about. Um, and I'm not really going to get into this. But know that conversion is a big thing. And we'll touch it on it a little bit later. But the LLC is great for that. And I'll talk about it later. Because you can take an LLC and convert it and then go public very quickly. That's why everyone seems to choose the LLC. And that was all the rage in the late 90s. But now the LLC isn't always the way to go, which I'll get into later. But this is something that you literally go out to California and you sit in a room with a bunch of lawyers. 500 people and they, you pay like $3,000 to learn how to convert stuff. So we're not going to touch on that because everyone would walk out anyway because it's all like internal revenue code stuff. So these are, your, these are your entities. The C corporation everyone knows about. Now everyone thinks the S corporation is a separate entity, but it's not. C corporation, an S corporation is a C corporation. You just do something to make it an S corporation. It's a tax consideration. Most people when they talk to me, business owners, well, I went online and I Googled it and we want to be an S corporation, and why would you want to do that? And then they tell me all the wrong reasons, and I'm like, well, don't Google anything anymore, because you, <laughs> you right? You, we've all had friends who've done this, right? I've had guys walk into my office, and well, we formed an LLC. I'm like, well, why did you do that? And here's the reasons why. I'm like, that was a horrible decision. And not saying I'm so smart, it's just they, they Google it, and it's the worst thing, right? And the little knowledge is a bad thing. Um, partnerships, which were the thing that everyone formed in this country for many years. You have general partnerships, limited partnerships, and limited liability partnerships. These are pass-through entities. Um, LLCs, everyone's favorite entity. And then the single member LLC. These are all pass-through <coughs> entities. So the legal formation of an entity and how its tax can differ. Now, it used to not be that way under the rules in the 90s. There were all these amorphous rules under the IRS. You form something, and then they'd kind of make a judgment, and they'd classify it. 
But then in the 90s, they changed the rules and they said, well, you can form an entity and then you can check the box, literally. Has anybody heard the term check the box before? Yeah, right? So you have a form and you form a company for one reason and then you could tax it in a different capacity, which is a fascinating concept, which has been a, a boon for tax lawyers, to be honest with you. When I came out of law school, this was all fairly new because I'm an old man and these guys are like, they can't actually be doing this. Like this is like just, the, I was the big four, I was at Coopers and Libraries, like this is the greatest thing that ever happened to us because now we can advise at the very beginning. Usually the clients came to us when they were already operating. Now we get the phone call in the beginning, we're funded and we want to do something, what type of entity, and then to be honest, we'd write like memos on what the best answer was. And this was a boon for the big four firms at the time. And now it's a settled piece of law that most people know about. So you can form literally any type of entity to a degree, with some exceptions, and then check the box to have it taxed a different way. So sometimes people make the mistake is they form an entity underneath and then they, tack, they check the box and tax it the wrong way. And again, that's a nuance I'm not going to get too deep into, but just know that sometimes what something is and how it's taxed are not always con con uh, congruous, okay? Um, and by the way, when you check the box, you have to stay that way for five years. You can't flip-flop it back and forth. Um, which a lot of people think they can. So the C corporation, the term piercing the corporate veil, that's the most important thing you have to think about when you're forming a company. At the end of the day, the taxes do matter, but you don't want someone coming into your life and grabbing your stuff, right? So piercing the corporate veil means the corporate veil gives me a protection. I form a corporation today, and all my assets, my home and everything else are protected as long as I obey the <laughs> corporate rules. I have meetings and things like that. You know, and a lot of people hold closely old C corporations and S corporations, they don't obey on any of those things and they should, but most people don't, but generally this, the, the, the uh, courts don't go against, against you. The C corporation's been around forever. Um, it's been around arguably since this country was owned by England. So the tax law and the case law is very, very strong. If you form a C corporation and you do some bad things, it's very difficult for them to get to your house in the Hamptons or your, your, your Upper East Side apartment. It's almost impossible. There are things you can do that if you don't hold up to the certain levels of what a corporation is, and you don't have meetings, you don't have agreements and stuff, if you're a real company, they can pierce it. But generally, it's very hard. And you've got hundreds of years of case law that are protecting you. And I say this for a reason because this is important. Corporations, people forget how important a corporation is and how strong it is. And if your concern is, let's say, I had a company that used to um, build beds. They made beds for a living. Unbeknownst to me, beds are a highly toxic thing to build. Very, very difficult to build and there's all these chemicals that basically wreck the environment. And what they did is, every company that they had in a different state, they formed another C corporation because their lawyer was so paranoid because they had been, this guy other, used to work at another bed company and they were sued out of business. And they were an LLC. And they got through and they got some of the assets of the company and they weren't afforded certain protections and the insurance wasn't good. So they got, now they formed all corporations, and it was impossible. They made sure they followed all the dogma of the C corporation and they were protected. So the case law is very, very strong in protecting assets for C corporations. The problem is you pay for that, right? It's doubly taxed. So the entity itself, IBM, is taxed, right? And then the, the, the dividends that go out to the shareholders, those are taxed. That's what the term double taxation means. So you're paying a price for protection. But if you're a big company, you don't mind paying that price. Apple and all these other companies, we all get dividends at some, some big company. You pay tax on that. And then Apple also, well not Apple, they don't pay taxes, neither does General Electric, but they're supposed to pay taxes, right? <laughs> they're supposed to pay taxes. And then this is the weird thing that is unique to only a few countries, but ours, is people who remember, despite your political leanings, uh, Romney said, well, corporations are people, right? That doesn't make any sense. Well, they are people. Um, this is, I think, the earliest case I could find. 1819, the U.S. Supreme Court said, no, they're a person. And the reason they're a person is because they can enter into an agreement. So one corporation can enter into an agreement with another corporation. And they made the analogy that only people can do that. And they said, well, no, if corporations are doing it, and one corporation can sue another, they're really people in some regard. So they have what's called personage status. It's not really people, it's personage. It's kind of a amorphous thing. People have feelings, families, and things like that. But corporations are afforded protections that people are. And that's a, that's a whole other discussion of whether corporations are people, but it's personage treatment, for lack of a better term. Um, and the income is only taxed to a shareholder when it's distributed for a C Corp. There's no, no limitation on anything you can do. The phone company I went out, uh, that I was at, had six rounds of funding. Uh, they've been bankrupt twice since. You've heard of them. They're called Broadview Networks. 
uh, they're downtown, they were horribly run, but they, the, the guy whose father was on the board, the chairman of the board or whatever, and his dad, all his buddies were bankers, so they just kept raising money. We had like the C series, the D series, you've heard about these things before. That's why people have C corporations. It's very flexible, raise capital, do whatever you want. Um, you can pay out basically any level of compensation to officers in a company, as long as it's reasonable, which I don't even know what that means anymore. <laughs> there was a law, I don't know if I remember, under the Clinton administration, regardless of you lining, leaning for Clinton, he tried to change the law and say this term reasonable. Originally he put a cap that you do not get a tax deduction for uh, over a million dollars if you're, which you're a corporate officer. But then they came up with all these creative stock option things and everything else and then they changed the law because it wasn't working. So it used to be they've tried to rein this thing in as we all know because we all read the newspaper in here, that doesn't happen. But originally they tried to do it. The term still exists in the law but it doesn't really mean anything. And generally C corporations are the only things that can be publicly traded. There are exceptions, there's publicly traded REITs um, and publicly traded partnerships. I won't get into those, another boring subject, but mostly everything publicly traded in this, co in this country and worldwide is some version of a C corporation, okay? Um, converting a C corp is very difficult. That's why when you make this decision, you have gotta be really careful on why you're doing it because when you form a corp, you're kind of hemmed in and even if you wanna change, let's say five years down the road because you checked the box, You've got all these asset considerations that if assets accumulate in value and things like that, when you liquidate and you distribute, there's all types of capital gains that come involved. It's not easy to do it. And so there's double taxation. So be careful. If you're going to form it, make sure you want to stay that way. If not, you can get, it can be very difficult to get rid of. Now this is my favorite form, is the S corporation. I'm an S corporation. Um, basically it's a C corporation and you file a form. And you say, okay, I check a box. I do two box checks, is basically I file election for the 2553, and then basically you're now hemmed in as an S corporation, admitting shareholders, additional shareholders can be a little bit difficult, transferring of interests can be difficult, and there's strict revenue allocation. More or less, if it's 40-40-20, the revenue's gotta go 40-40-20, profit sharing and things like that. Um, S C corporations are a little different obviously, there's a lot of things you can do, and then obviously LLCs and partnerships we'll talk about are different. S corporations are very strict. And most of the time you want to really be in bed with the people you're in an S corporation with. And there's a lot of requirements. Only domestic corporations or eligible entities can be involved. Those are partnerships or LLCs. They can be the underlying entity, right? They can, you can form an entity and then check the box to be an S corporation. Um, only individual persons, people like us, can be shareholders. Trusts can be as well, but corporations and partnerships cannot. So this corporation difference I talked about before matters here, right? So this is a natural person, individual person that has a heartbeat. Corporations, which according to Mr. Romney are people, well not really because in this situation they're not a person, they have personage status. So it's a little bit different. Only US citizens or residents can be shareholders and Steve can tell the difference. Of, I'm sure he's gone through this many times in his practice. There are exceptions to that rule. Um, only one class of stock and you can only have 100 shareholders. And those are the rules. If you violate those at any time, then you get kicked out, and I've seen this and I've represented people, and then you become a C corporation. And if you run afoul of this and the IRS audits you, then they go back and then they change you all the way back to a C corporation. And then you're gonna have tax on all of that. And it's questionable whether you, where the taxes lie, because you've got to pay the C corporation tax, and do you go back and get an S corporation refund for the taxes you paid personally? So you want to really respect this type of stuff. It's, otherwise, it could be very, very nasty from a tax perspective. Um, now, I think it's great in every level except this is the one place where no one likes to form them because, and this is in red for a reason, this city does not respect it. New York City is the one place in America that doesn't really respect the S corporation. So if you're an S corporation here, you pay New York City corporate taxes. The S corporation at the state level, the income passes through. At the federal level, it passes through. But if New York City, you actually have to pay 8.885% of your revenue. And that's it. That's one of the downsides of doing it. Um, and then people are always, that's why they always want to go with a partnership and they always want an LLC because they know of this high level of taxation. And I'll have an example later to show you how it works out. But I think there's benefits to doing the S Corp besides this. Um, and the tax is only paid when the income is passed through. Does everyone understand what I mean by pass through? Yeah, okay, okay. Now, this is the reason, uh, the other reason you don't want to form the S Corp is I badmouth my favorite entity is believe it or not, the people on this building, that building, all these other buildings, they're all in LLCs, if they're smart. 
um, and you pay no tax whatsoever on any of the income derived from this building if you're an LLC. It is a massive loophole in what's called the unincorporated business tax law. Corporations are incorporated, right? LLCs and partnerships are not. So then the people who built this city years ago said, well, if we're going to have a tax, we're building owners, and the only reason everyone comes here is because we built these buildings, so we don't want to pay any taxes on the revenue. And back then, because everyone was really corrupt, they said, fine. So, and that's very simple. So everyone here who owns a business in this city that doesn't own real estate and derive revenue pays New York City taxes of some capacity. However, the left rack family, Larry Silverstein, the related companies, you name them, all of them, they pay no taxes to New York City on the revenue derived from the management or the revenue of any rental income in New York City. Period. Since when? Oh God, I, I, I feel like it's 60s, but don't quote me. I should have looked that up and I was going to. I just ran out of time, but it's been forever. And if they tried to change it, all the lawyers from Sullivan and Cromwell, McDermott, Will and Ever, would all go to town hall and they'd kill de Blasio. they just kill him. I mean, because <laughs> this is billions, right? If you think about this, ever hear people, you want to get into an argument with someone at a cocktail party, say, well, then just tax all the rental income. I've done this before, like, what do you mean? I'm like, you don't know this? This is billions of dollars in this city alone. This is like a city country, right? Could you imagine how much revenue the city would get for this? But they don't do it, because we have powerful lobbying in this city that would never allow for it. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, the, the, reason I love self, the reason I love S corporations is you don't pay self-employment tax, right? Anybody here has formed their own, filed their own tax return, they know what I mean. Um, so self-employment tax, I own my own company, I pay myself a salary, I pay both sides of the self-employment tax equation. I pay both sides. The corporation pays it and I pay myself, just like I was an employee of the company. However, the income, the net income of my company, so I have $100, I pay myself $80 in salary, I have $20 in net income. That 20 bucks, I only pay personal income tax. That's all I pay. I don't pay any of the taxes on that. LLCs are different. LLCs, you continue to pay self-employment tax. And the new Obama taxes all come into play. That's where there's a big, big difference. And for me, it's all about taxes. Unless you need asset protection, you know what I'm saying? Then these things all start to change. But you have to keep these things. Otherwise, I'm always like, stay with C corporations. But LLCs, at the end of the day, you're going to get killed from a tax perspective. And we'll talk about it. And this is a big deal. Does everyone know what the Medicare surtax is and the additional tax, the additional Medicare taxes? There's two of them, 3.8% and 0.9%. These things are only hitting this year when you file your tax returns. And if you're a high owner, married over 250 a year, and single over 200, you're going to be introduced to this this year. And I hope your tax professional has told you about it. Um, the ones worth their salt have talked to you. If they haven't, you're probably going to be looking for a new CPA because you're going to be so pissed off, um, to be honest with you. Um, so basically, as corporations, you pay yourself a salary. Um, and if you think about it, there's a lot of, because that self-employment tax thing, people play around with it. So you pay yourself less salary, so you don't pay as much self-employment tax, and then the net income pays in, and you only pay the personal income tax. Um, it gets a little dicey. The one fun thing about S corporations in the first years, for those who start on their own, you can do some really fun things. Um, I have a lot of bookkeeper friends, um, and they've explained to me what you can do in the first few years. When I first formed it, I didn't think about this. What you can do is you can go to paychecks. In 2014, you work all year, you draw down out of your operating account, you take money out of your operating account, you pay no taxes all year. You call paychecks on December 15th say, I, I had $300,000 revenue, I pay myself $200,000 salary, and I want to withhold $40,000. Now, in any other situation, you have a major tax penalty for not paying taxes all year. Not if you're an S-Corp. Basically, paychecks puts you on an annual payroll, all the money gets annualized back, and you're free and clear. Meanwhile, you've had the money all year. Now, my old partner at my old firm, uh, Shelly Gotch, I don't know if anybody knows her, she's been in the city for years. She's the one that turned me on to networking. She's the one that flipped me from an LLC person to an escort person. She sat me down one day in a room and explained all this to me years ago. And I was like, oh. And she goes, this is the thing that you want to tell your smaller clients because this is something people don't know about in those first few years. And I tell people this. I'm like, well, what do you mean? And they're like, yeah, you can just withhold all at the end of the year if you're an adult enough to keep the money around, which some people spend, and then they're <laughs> completely burned. And my bookkeepers say, don't advise your clients unless you know they're putting the money aside. Because what happens is tax bill comes due, 15.3% of your self-employment tax, and then whatever the withholding is, like, oh my god, oh, $80,000? So that's why most of the time you do it quarterly, or you do it every other week. 
But if you're adult enough to do this and you're investing your money in other places, like if you have money with Lorna's company and you're investing in properties, then you can do that. And also you have all this money you've used all year. You pull it out and then you pay it. And it all goes annualized back. The S Corporation has so many loopholes. They're actually trying to close it. I don't know if anybody knows this. Under Obamacare, people complained because the S Corporation gets such favorable status. Because outside of New York City, there's never a reason to fall an LLC unless you're going to have people coming in and out. S corporations are so favorable in every other state, there's no reason to ever form one. If you do business here, there's a tax problem like I talked about, we'll get more into. But outside of New York City, there's no reason to ever not form an S corporation because of the tax play. Um, yeah, quick question. Sure. Um, you're, you're using the term S corporation saying that these companies have to form as an inc. But can you be an LLC and elect an S corp tax? You can, but and does that give, does that fall in the same category as when you're talking about? You S-Corp? can, but most people never would never do that. It's a very tricky play. Okay. There's no reason to normally do it because why would you form an LLC? Because as as I said, the LLC case law of protection of assets is 20 years old, right? 1994, mm-hmm. 93. You got hundreds of years C corp law, and LLC cases have been pierced. You know this as a corporate lawyer. There are instances where they pierce the corporate veil and they grab the personal assets of it. So most people will never form an LLC and change an S-Corp unless I would tell them or you would tell them afterwards, like, oh, you didn't realize that. Generally, you will form a corp and then check the box. You can do it, but it's almost self-defeating because now you've weakened your legal position, right? Because you get sued based upon the legal formation, not the tax. So the purpose of the discussion of S-Corp really means ink. Right, yeah, ink, yeah. But do you understand what Craig's question was? He's saying you form an LLC underneath and you could check the box, sure, but the LLC doesn't give you the same asset protection as the C-Corp, so why not form a corporation and then check the box as an S-Corp? Does that make sense? Yes. No? Yes? No, I'm looking around. Does that make sense? Or no? Okay. Okay. Um, see, there's a difference here. Is if you're LLC, they are supposed to pay salaries. They can't pay shareholder salaries or anything else. You have to pay a draw for people who own LLCs in this room. And then you've got to make a quarterly estimated payment. Right? Every quarter, I've done that before. I was a partner in a CPA firm. You're going to make that. And that has a big effect on your cash flow if you're making that March, June, September payment instead of making it in December. And then you can do whatever you want. You can do and change it around. But you've got, got to hit your mark every quarter. And if you're underpaying a quarter, then you've got to annualize it. And it's a big headache. Meanwhile, with the S Corp, you don't have to worry about these things. Um, payroll is a big deal. I won't get into this because I'm probably running long. But this is the big number, 15.3% payroll tax. Um, again, FICA payroll taxes only uh, basically on the payroll, but not on the income of the company. Um, but you got to be careful. You've got to make sure you pay the right salary. You can't underpay yourself. This is a huge audit risk. People sometimes pay themselves. They have a million dollar company. They pay themselves $40,000 a year. The IRS, they come in and audit you. And then they hit you with a massive penalty. Okay. So what's reasonable? Some people try and do zero, which obviously no one works for free. Um, some people will do oddly minimum wage, below minimum wage. I've seen that before. Um, what's reasonable, it's not the fine. You just kind of got to go back and forth. One of my clients, uh, basically, he has $4 million and he pays himself 150000 I tell him he's underpaid every year. He refuses to listen to me. Luckily, the IRS has not audited him, but he will not pay himself anymore. And he's got a massive exposure. But he doesn't listen to me. He's my <laughs> oldest client, but he's like, screw him. So he just does whatever he wants. Um, and I'm like, okay, that's your choice. Um, um, I'll move along here. Okay. So Jack, what is reasonable? Uh, how, do you, how do you determine what's a reasonable rate? Well, I think what you do is you look at a, the market. Company the same size, what do they generally pay? And you try and figure it out from there. If you have a $4 million company, you're paying yourself $100,000, not reasonable because you're the CEO. <coughs> so I, I look at it as, as a ratio, and basically you look at the marketplace and what it pulls. The flip of it, the problem is, is you can overpay yourself too, right? So you have $300,000 in revenue, you pay yourself $250,000 in salary. That's not okay either, because the IRS is saying, well, then you're not not paying enough income tax on the other side. So it's it's an odd sliding scale. There's no rules on it, which is how the IRS makes their money, because they come in and audit you, and they never tell you what they want, which is one of the reasons tax lawyers, I guess, have jobs. Um, (laughs) The important thing here is that if you screw this up, uh, payroll tax, you pay 100% of the taxes though. That's the penalty. It's really severe. Um, and I wish I had a clear answer. And it's all case law. Again, you'd fall asleep if I went through all the nuances. But if you have that question, call a CPA, call another tax lawyer, call me. And then basically what you do is you look at a study and you say, this is what the industry does on a percentage basis, David. You say, okay, if you, were a, you own a technology company, 
Cy owns a technology company. What does the CEO of that company pay? And then literally shot those documents, you're fair. You start playing around, you get yourself in trouble. Um, moving on, partnerships, I won't get too much into them. Basically, used to be the most common thing in this country. You have general partnerships, limited partnerships, and limited liability partnerships. Um, pass through entities, again, everything moves up. The partnership allocation rules are very complicated. Um, similar to S corporations, tax is paid at the partner level. Um, General partnerships are very dangerous to form. No one really does them anymore um, because the IRS and the states have changed it, but generally you're on the hook for everything. If you remember years ago for the older folks in the room, everyone's a general partnership. That means you could pierce, there was no corporate veil. They come in, you screwed up, they take your family, your life, your house. No one does those things anymore. They're basically unheard of. Uh, limited partnerships are what most other people used to do before the LLC came along. Um, basically you'd have a general partner. He was exposed, everyone else was an investment partner or a limited partner, and they had no exposures in any way. Certain protections were afforded to them. Um, and again, all this, you, unless you're a limited partner, the general partner and the general partner and the limited partnership has all the self-employment tax issues. Every piece of that income is all self, um, subject to self-employment tax, which are big numbers. Um, limited liability partnerships were formed right when I came out of college, and they basically were formed because the CPA and lawyer lobby was very strong, and they said, we want to form companies where we're not on the hook at all, but we want to do whatever we want. And to do that, you have to be an accountant, an architect, an engineer, and a lawyer to form a limited liability partnership. You have to have a certification of a professional standard at some point, and then all the assets are protected in a limited liability partnership. However, that's been pierced too. For those of us who remember Arthur Anderson, uh, Arthur Anderson went down, <coughs> they were an LLP, and some of those guys took a bath. So again, this is not a corporation. They like to, see, they like to say there's protection, <laughs> but there's not as much as a corporation. Does the LLP have to be within that state certified license? In other words, all members have to be architects, all members have to be lawyers, or can you have lawyers and accountants? And no, you can't mix them, not here. Not it, lawyers and accountants, but like architects. Generally, no. Lawyers like like lawyers accountants. and accountants can play ball in Europe, right? And right. You know that, Craig. But, right, right, right. but yeah, but in this country, no. And generally, you should be, now the architects and engineers might be able to. I, I won't, I'm not an expert. I know the lawyers and the CPAs don't get along as a guy. I work with CPAs my whole life. But The percentages change in architecture firms. You can have people that aren't licensed like architects. You can, okay, you can. I, and I thought, there was a, I thought there was a difference. I know with the lawyers and the CPAs, you cannot put them together. At least I can't share profits. I was a lawyer with CPA firms my whole life, but I was never allowed to share the profits of the firm because the CPA wouldn't, CPAs wouldn't allow it, to be honest with you. Um, now, this is the one that everyone uses, the LLC. Um, this is actually created under state law. It's a state fiction, if you will. So it abides by the state law. I remember when I first came out of law school, not everyone respected it, okay? It has the characteristics of a corporation and a partnership. Like a corporation, no one's liable, supposedly, for any of the, all the obligations of the LLC. Um, great fixability on the way it operates, and you don't need to obey the corporate formalities. So great, tremendous flexibility. That's why everyone forms LLCs. The downside will go through. Okay, unlike S corps, form as many different levels of ownership as you want. Really do whatever you want to do with an S corporation. You can't do. You can allocate your income any way you want. You have sweat equity partners. Everyone's heard of that term, right? People come in and out. You have guys who've never computed a dime, and your guy puts five hundred thousand dollars in. Can't really do that in S corporation. Partnerships too, very very tricky stuff. There are treatises written about it. LLCs are kind of like Craig. Do whatever you want, right? Like just figure it out. And unless something blows up, then you call Craig and he represents one side or the other. That's kind of the way it works. But otherwise, you can do whatever you want. But there's a toll that you pay to do that. Um, and again, in LLC, like Craig said, you can do whatever you want from a tax perspective, too. You can form it, and then you can tax it any way you want, within reason. Then you have the single member LLC. Everyone's heard of those, right? Basically, that's what a lot of small business owners are, a lot of my clients. You only have one member. Uh, basically, you make an election to be a disregarded entity. That means you file your taxes on your Schedule C. If you're going to do that, I do recommend uh, that you get an employment identification number, especially if you have more than one. Because if you don't do that, and this is where my tax stuff comes in again, is what they can do is then they can take all your LLCs and put them all into one bucket, and then you can be subject to any type of audit you want. If you have separate EIN numbers, especially for sales tax, they can only audit one EIN number at a time under every sales tax law in this country to date. They've not changed it. They've tried to do consolidated audits. So if you have a company that sells something that's taxable, believe it or not, even services now are taxable in most states, more than you think, 
Get any IM number, you just go online, you get it. It's very easy. And it doesn't change anything, you just have it. If you don't, then all your, you got 25 LLCs, 25 Schedule Cs, they'll just audit you personally for all the sales tax. If you have 25 EIN numbers, they can't do that. But it's still passed through as... Still passed through, right? You're on your Schedule C, and you still get all the benefits of everything else like that. Um, just know you still have all the self-employment downside. Um, so they check if they want to be taxed to partnership. You can be disregarded. Like I said, most multi-members usually choose partnerships. Most people don't. Do what Craig said, they don't form an LLC and go corporation because they're like, why would I do that? Let's just be a corporation and go the reverse. But sometimes it's done, and usually it's done after the fact. Because someone comes to Craig or me and they're like, well, we didn't know what we were doing. And you're like, well, you made a mistake. And by the way, you're only operating in New Jersey. There's absolutely no reason that you should do it any other way. And the tax benefits are much stronger. The downside is this. All non-passive income is subject to self-employment tax. Okay, you could transfer the LLC interest, entrepreneurial enterprises, people come in, they come out, right? Films, hotels, right? Anytime you see a movie now, it says whatever movies, um, Selma, LLC. It all says that, because you can get guys in and out real quick. Money goes in, money comes out, very simple to do, okay? But there are tax consequences to it, and that's why the self-employment tax number is dangerous, okay? Your self-employment taxes on basically all of the income with the S corporation only pays on the wage income. I'll give you an example. And this has a material tax effect, and then I'm done. Okay? So here's an example. Married for and jointly, two 50% owners A and B of an S corporation. 700 of revenue, 80 expenses, 420 a salary, 200 of net income. So arguably, and my numbers could be off, 310 goes on the person return of A, 210 a salary, 100K of S corp. None of that additional income is subject to the Medicare tax surcharge from Obamacare. Okay, so this is your tax bill. Um, this has to do with the ceiling on, on the self-employment tax. Medicare tax, by the way, has no ceiling. They change that. So basically, if this number is really large, if this payroll number is bigger, let's say you're paying yourself a huge salary, once you hit 117,000, you're not paying on the, you're paying 13 point, no, 12.9, no, sorry, 12.4, and then 2.9% you pay into infinity. So if you have a really large company and you're, you're an LLC, you're going to continue to pay tax into ad for nine. That's 2.9% plus the Obama taxes on top. So you're looking at 7% of tax on top that goes on forever. So you have a big company and you're an LLC, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble where an S-Corp does have some level of control. Okay? So that's what it comes down to, the state tax. Here it is. And this is the, the, the share of the tax bill at New York City because you pay the 885% I talked about before. So this is the total tax bill to the S Corp and the shareholder, all put in. Now, I'm only counting the one shareholder's portion of all this. If you do this as an LLC, though, right, you got two 50% owners, same thing. Now you're going to start having the Obamacare numbers kick in. Remember I told you the $250,000, there's a threshold you must cross, but everything else goes in the pot. So now what you've got are these numbers. All the red ones are new. So you got this number, which didn't exist before. You got this is not that big. And then you have that number. That's the net income number. That's the number that hurts you. If you've ever seen a K1, right, that's line one on your K1. The, L, the 1065 K1 and the 1120 K1, 1120 SK1 look identical, right? They're harmless. Line one net income. That net income on your S corporation, you pay no self-employment tax. For the LLC, you pay this tax. And that number starts to add up. It gets really significant. <clears throat> And then this is what it comes down to. This is the only benefit. You're in New York City, so your tax bill is half. You go to $4,000. So what you get here is this number. And you get 13 additional thousand dollars for nothing. And you're just donating the money. And then, and this is my last slide, so I'll take questions after this. But you're just donating the money. And like, for what benefit? And that's why I always talk people out of LLCs, because for people who have LLCs that are growing, this number starts to get really big. If you've got a profitable company, as Mike shakes his head, because he works with guys who own LLCs, and we've, Mike has helped me with clients and given me clients that I've talked out of doing this exact thing, because I'm like, all right, in the beginning, you're going to make 500000 But you think you're going to make a lot of money, right? I'm like, well, what happens when you make $2 million? When you make $5 million? Then this number is astronomical, and you're like, why didn't I fire my CPA and my lawyer? And usually it's a non-tax lawyer, right, that forms the LLC, or it's the CPA, nothing against CPAs, because it's just an easy way to do it. 
The S corporation, you gotta look at the numbers, you run models, and figure out how the tax play plays out. But if you assume the company's gonna grow, and it's not a closely held S corporation, I mean a closely held company, and you think it's gonna grow, you always wanna go with the S corp, because otherwise the LLC numbers from a tax perspective get out of hand. I've had people call me up and say I'm paying so much, I'm like, now my assets are valuable. In the beginning, I put uh, $500,000 assets in, now the assets are worth $5 million in my company. I'm like, well, good luck converting, because you have all these tax considerations that you didn't know about, and you're getting crushed, and there's no way out unless you pay the tax toll. And to do that, that's like putting a bullet to your head because it's just gigantic and there's no benefit to it. So Matt, I'm sorry, go ahead. This is my last slide anyway. So, so. As a, so if you have an LLC though, do you not have some more flexibility in, I'll call it, personal business expenses than you do with the sub -S? No. No. No, not at all. No, it's the same. It's the same. It's basically reasonable expenses. You have to prove why you have the expenses. And by the way, I'm doing a personal income tax audit for someone right now, and her paperwork is really bad, and it's with the state, and it's very, very difficult. I had one a year ago, same situation, more, made more money, and her paperwork was pristine calendars, you know, proof of why she did it, the business outcome of the meetings, all those type of things. If you don't have those type of things, Matt, it doesn't matter what type of entity you are. S Corp, C Corp, same thing. You could be a closely held C Corp. I do a lot of work in the construction industry. All those guys are C Corps. They don't even want to be S Corps. They're like, we're a C corporation. We're fine paying that money. And all those guys have to keep track of everything. And the ones that don't, I had one I went through and it was horrible. I went and went through, they had everything lined up and the state didn't touch them. So. What about distributions that are taken from an S corp? For example, if an S corp makes $500,000, 150 salary, $100,000 for distribution. Right. So you have 250 left. Is it distribution tax to the individual? I'm just a yeah, well, yes and no. Um, there's something called the AAA account, the accumulated adjustments account. You ever heard of that? Mm -hmm. you, well, well, you have, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else has, but basically it's previously taxed income, so no, the distributions are not. But there's a tricky equation in what the accumulated, the AAA account, has anybody ever heard of this before? Yeah, yeah. okay. The AAA account is basically, it's not the basis, Similar to the basis, right? And you could, there, there are courses that could be te taught on that. I probably couldn't teach one because it's so complicated. But basically, the AAA account says how much of this has already been taxed already? How much is passed through on that line one? And then you add back certain expenses, and certain expenses don't get added back, like meals and expenses. And that's a calculated calculation. And that AAA account is a valuable win. Mike, when is that valuable? When you sell it, right? You want to sell it, and you want to get out. Because then what you do is you have all this money you have $500,000 sitting in your business account. And you're like, fuck, this is all taxable. But you're like, maybe it's not. And most people don't do the AAA account forever because they never think they're going to sell it. So like, and they never want to retire. And then two years before they retire, they call the financial planner, Mike, and like, what am I going to do? And hopefully Mike calls a good CPA. They do an analysis of the AAA account. And they're like, it's all been taxed. And you pull it all out. The LLC calculation is equally, um, equally complicated as well. Um, and that could be a whole nother animal because you've been paying self-employment taxes the whole time and it's not as favorable. But the AAA account is a whole nother animal and that's something that if anybody here has an S corporation, I highly recommend doing that analysis every year along with your basis analysis too. Because again, when you sell your company, which hopefully everyone here will do for millions of dollars, whatever, whatever the basis is and whatever you sell it for, that difference is what? Capital gains, right. And you want to do that because then you've got to hire some CPA, nothing against them, you're going to pay, spend $10,000 to do a basis analysis because they'll go back 25 years and good luck if you have those tax returns. So the AAA account and the basis account, you have to keep track of them. If you don't, you'll be flying in the dark and then when someone comes to you and says, I want to buy your company, you're going to have a lot of out-of-pocket expenses to figure out what your company's even worth from a tax perspective. Not what someone's going to buy it for, but what it, what's worth to you to actually sell it and what you have to report. Yesterday, the uh, mayor made some announcements about business taxes in New York City. Oh, de Blasio, yeah, yeah. I didn't talk about it for a simple reason. It's number one, I never talk about proposed taxes. And it's I'll tell proposed, you. It's not yeah, and the reason why is because there's been a lot of proposals, right? They were going to have taxes on internet sales and things like that. De Blasio is not well liked, um, as we all know. Um, and Andrew Cuomo, I know people know Andrew Cuomo, uh, and they don't get along. And he has not done things in New York City that we all know about. And he's proposed a lot of things that didn't get passed. And I didn't want to confuse anybody because I hate you to walk out of here and say, oh my God, this is great. And then five months ago, I'm like, what the hell was he talking about? Because it has to get approved. If it was approved, I would have talked about it. Because I read about it, I'm like, it's not even worth getting into 
Because in my business, there's always proposals, right? Uh, tax business is always proposals. There's types of things that never get passed. So, but I was going to bring it up at the end. Yes, he proposed a bunch of things. You know, if you want, you give me your email addresses. It'll probably, I sent out a newsletter. If it passes, it'll be out in my newsletter next month because we're here, but I've not gotten into it. I don't think a lot of it will pass, though. But hopefully I'm wrong because it is favorable to small businesses, which would help everyone yeah. in the room. Do the same considerations apply to single member LLC and partnership? Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, you get crushed too. Yeah, you get hit on all that, yeah, unfortunately. Only, the, the only thing that doesn't apply, the, re, the real estate business is the New York City play. And that's a big play. I did work for the second largest landholder in New York City, and I saved them 2.5 million into perpetuity every single year. Because they held their property before the law changed in C Corp, an S corporation. So then I changed everything, they paid a massive tax bill. And now they don't pay taxes on any of the revenue. They had 150 buildings they owned, all held in corporations. I'm like, what idiot formed this? I'm like, well, they formed it in like the 50s. So I'm like, well, maybe that's not stupid. But then they paid like, I don't know how many millions to get out of it because they, they're a family business that's on the third generation. It's very difficult. And that's why people here, if you feel that anyone owns the land in this city, it's never in a corporation. That's, that's when what I'm saying about S corporations makes no sense. If you have friends on land, like, that guy's crazy. Well, because they're business, they're landowners. If you're not, I like the other way. So, anybody else? Oh. How easily can you change from LLC to escort? Well, L well, LLC is actually not so bad. Because in LLC, right, everyone knows almost everybody owned an LLC in the early 2000s. Formed, they did it twice. They wanted to go public. So going LLC to C Corp, as I talked about before, maybe I glossed over it, isn't so bad. There's not a lot to it. And then once you form the C corporation, you then check a box and you file a form. So that's not so bad. It's going the other way. Forming corporations going the other way can be very, very dangerous. But generally, the conversion isn't so, so difficult. I'm simplifying it, though. There's simplifying it, though. Um, when, you form the S, when you form a C corporation and you're an S corporation, then you want to go back the other way. There's all type of issues. Called, people have heard of these things called hot assets. Have you ever heard of this? An asset that accumulates in value. You have to pay a capital gain on this type of stuff. So it's very, very tricky. That's why Dave wanted me to talk about this, because some of your clients want to form companies. And you say, before you go online and do what NOLO tells you, right, which is what everyone does, right? That's the company everyone uses, Craig, when they come to you. They go, oh, I went online and NOLO is the. I sent them to you first. Yeah. <laughs> Those were three times cut at once. Right, right. But, but that's like Shapiro's organization, right? NOLO? The guy? Oh, well, yeah, that's, that's Shapiro's yeah. organization. Yeah. Legal Zoom, that's part of NOLO. I think they're all the same thing. He's wrecked millions of companies in this country as a result. So, with an L so just follow with this question. If people are doing a pass-through LLC, can they check the box to S and do the savings, or they have to convert them to an A? No, no, you can. But again, why would you form an LLC? But if you did it, in the business. yeah, you could do it, sure. But then it, there's a timing issue. If you're an LLC, you check the box to be a partnership. You've got to wait five years to go back the other way. That's right. why I said in the beginning, you have, you're stuck. Right. If you don't do anything, you got to make your decision. I don't they, know why you'd ever do. For the turn of the century, like you're saying, 2000. Yeah, those this, guys are this converting. Is the time for them to, to, to convert. evaluate and refer. Right, to you. especially if they're outside the city. If you're outside the city, it's easy. I have people in New Jersey. I'm like, why would you ever do anything different? You know, and they're like, oh, because the city stuff. I'm like, you don't pay taxes to the city. My accountant told me that. And I'm like, oh, okay. So, hope this is helpful. Oh, sorry. Is there a statute of limitation? Oh, uh, you mean when you form the C Corp? Well, you have to you have to check the box two and a half months into the year. So that's March fifteenth from the formation, or two and a half months from when you formed it. I do not recall. It's a great question. I won't lie to you. No one's ever asked me that. I don't believe you're ever in a situation that you cannot check the box. I can send you. I, I know what you're saying. So I formed today C Corp. Three years out, can I make myself an S Corp? Is right. what you're saying. I, I don't know, and there are tax implications at that point to doing things, because S corporations aren't taxed and C corporations are. Mm -hmm. If you want, I could, I've, I've never been asked the question before, because usually the decision's made fairly quickly. Right, but, but someone who doesn't have the knowledge of the S corp, they probably would not have made that election. Right. But what if after coming to a seminar like this, they learn? Yeah, no, uh, contact, I won't lie to you. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. That's a, that's a fantastic, I've never been asked that question. But, okay. great. Well, anything else? S corp. <laughs> That's right, Dave. So who knew, I guess you guys all did know, that discussions on energy choice and, and, the, and all the alternatives and trade-offs, who knew it was going to be so interesting? 
That's why we're here. That's why we did it. I knew you. I had extra coffee. Cool. So how good was that? Thank you. Thank you. So much. Thanks.